Here we go. Hi, Joe Manfredo. How you doing? Good, Don. How are you? I'm I'm excellent, and thank you for uh, being a, a guest on on the Bandmasters podcast today. And and I think we talked about this yesterday that you are probably the the most referenced, uh, well now present guest that I've I've had on the show. So it's it's absolutely a pleasure to to have you on here. And uh, thanks for taking some time out to to speak with me today. Well, you've really put together just something that's very special. Um, I've had a chance to go through quite a few of the uh, other interviews and just real impressed. I mean, it's, it's a great product for people to learn about their history, learn about uh, uh, influential people in, in the band business. So congratulations on just doing just a superb work here. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So here's an unplanned segue because I've got, I'm in my basement. It's cold down here. So I got my coffee cup. My coffee cup has uh, the Joliet band on it, and I don't know if you can see, but there's a picture of A.R. McAllister on there. And uh, I understand you're currently working on a little research project of the Joliet American Legion Band. How's that going? Well, I'm kind of in the infancy of it. We've been collecting a lot of information. We still have a lot more information to go. Uh, As you know, uh, Mike Fisk, who used to be band director at Joliet uh, Township, Mike has played a big role in this because he is the present director for the Joliet American Legion Band. He's been setting up interviews for me. He's got several band members who have been in the band for over 50 years. So there's a wealth of knowledge there. The Joliet Municipal uh, History uh, Museum, I reached out to them and they're just a great wealth of information. So just collecting a lot of information right now and hopefully get a chance to write a paper on it and maybe do a presentation. Well, I'm really looking forward to that final product. Uh, Of course, I'm very sympathetic to all of the student musicians that are out there right now that can't participate in their ensembles. But uh, my my thoughts go out to our community members as well, because I know those community organizations are a very important musical and social outlet for them. Oh, absolutely. And isn't it something about Joliet, the, the region in terms of band? I mean, great school band programs and then a great uh, junior college program for their band program. Absolutely. And, and then the uh, American Legion Band, which is, in essence, a community band. Yeah, it's a very fun place to be for band. Well, let's begin how uh, I typically begin the episodes officially, which is a brief musical and educational upbringing from you. Uh, I'm from Calumet City, Illinois, a south suburb. Uh, went to Thornridge High School. Uh, Art Wasik was was my band director and just a very you know, wonderful man, great trumpet player. During that time at high school, uh, I studied both piano and clarinet. And I was really fortunate to have two exceptional teachers there, uh, private teachers. Jane Masker was my piano teacher. Fred Chamberlain was my clarinet teacher, and they just invested so much in me. Uh, I know I wouldn't have been become a music major if it wasn't for them. So very, very important people in my life. I did a bachelor's and master's degree at Eastern Illinois University. Bachelor's was in music ed, of course, and then my master's degree was in conducting. I understand your doctoral studies at the University of Illinois had a few big names in music education. Listen to this lineup. Director of bands was Harry Beejan, one of the all-time greats. Gary Smith was director of the Marching Illini. And Jim Kernel uh, just started when I got there as uh, an associate director of bands. And Jim was, of course, all the writing so many of his great works during that time period where I had a chance to work with him. So, you know, I learned so much just by taking it all in from those three uh, phenomenal people and, and band directors. There's almost like no option but to get a great education when you have people like that as your mentors. Absolutely. The name Dr. Beejin comes up quite a bit on this podcast. Would you mind going into a little bit of your relationship with him? Yeah, I had a really special relationship with him, both personally and professionally. Uh, You know, playing in his band, you really learn about what true excellence in in musicianship is. And you know, just seeing how he worked through uh, rehearsals in preparation for a performance, it's just a wonderful learning experience. Now, as I said, personally, I had a very close relationship with him. There were many times after he retired, uh, I take my family up to uh, Lake Hubbard. That's where he uh, retired to. 
a northeast part of Michigan and just vacation up there for a week and just have a, t have a wonderful time just to sit down with him, go through scores, listen to recordings. You know, so it was just a, a he always was very nurturing, you know, whether it was during my time at Illinois or during those times where we would vacation with him. So my um, my high school band director, Mr. Liga, he had a close relationship with him as well. And, and I'm sure you could relate to this a little. I was at his house once and uh, I was I was younger. I was probably late, late teens, early 20s. And in his living room, there's a lot of beautiful artwork. But then there was a picture, a framed picture of a very stoic looking Armenian guy just doing oh, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I said, Mr. Liga, who is that? And uh, he kind of looked both ways and he goes, eh, if the house was burning down, this would be one of the first things that I'd save. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, and, me, let me tell you about that photograph, because this is something that uh, Dr. Beejan shared with me. You know, he thought just the highest of, uh, about Ted and what a great, not only what a great musician and teacher he was, but what a great person he was. And he, and he told me of a time that the two of them got together after a performance and Ted had his conductor's binder. And he, he grabbed Beach and he says, Harry, I want, to, want you to show you something. And he opened up the binder, and in the back of the binder was that photograph of Beejan. And that was his retirement picture. And he, and he looked at Beejan and he says, I pull this out any time I have to have a really good rehearsal because it reminds me about what I have to achieve. So th those two were, were very, very close, and they had the utmost respect for each other. So you, you had a relationship with Dr. Beach and, you know, for, for quite a while then. When you think about a, a rehearsal with him, are there some things that you thought about that you directly took um, from Dr. Beach and with, with your own teaching? Oh, yeah, there are so many different things. Uh, I mean, my, my concept of programming, I, I, you know, I really learned so much about programming from him that you know, I, I used throughout my career. I should say uh, at first though, what brought me to Illinois was uh, obviously being from the state. I, I was very much aware of the University of Illinois and the great band program that Beecham had. He started in the early 1970s a, a band conductor internship program. And Myron Welch, you know, the former director of bands at University of Iowa, Myron was the first uh, conducting intern. And he got the idea of the internship from the New York Philharmonic Conductors Internship that, that Leonard Bernstein had started. And so it, he brought in one, maybe two interns every year and worked with them. It was a one-on-one -on -one situation. So, you know, whether you were studying conducting, repertoire, score analysis, whatever, you know, you were working with him one-on-one. -on -one. And then on top of that, you were assigned to conduct one of the university bands, as well as assisting in the conducting of other, uh, the other university bands. So you're constantly you know, on the podium rehearsing a variety of bands, and there was never a time in the two years that, that I was an intern that someone wasn't watching me when I was up on the podium, primarily Beejan but as well as Colonel would step in, Gary Smith would step in and watch. And then you had a chance after the rehearsal to sit down and kind of, you know, talk through things. What could you have done better? What went well? Those type of things. So, you know, it was a very unique program during the, the time that I, I was the last intern from eight, 1982 to 1984. And at that time, Throughout the country, you did not have the number of DMA and conducting programs. You know, nowadays, uh, there's so many. Everyone's offering a, a doctorate in wind conducting. And back then, there wasn't anything like that. So it was a very unique program, and it filled a void at that time. And from, the, from that program, there were, I think, 14 interns. You know, there were people of the stature of Myron Welch. You know, there were many, many others. And so... Great experience there, and so whether it was whether it was programming, whether you know selection of literature, whether it was uh, rehearsal techniques, developing the band sonority, I think that's one of the, one of the things that that I was most interested in when I was uh, to study with Beejan uh, and trying to select which program I, I was going to go to. You know, whether it was University of Illinois, I was also interested in the University of Michigan. 
Indiana University, you know, great band programs at great schools of music. And what kept drawing me back to the Illinois was the sound of the Illinois band. I thought it was a very unique sound and it had the darkness, the richness that, you know, I was looking for. And so I wanted to go ahead and find out how did Beejan create that sound? And so he talked about instrumentation and its impact on developing the sonority. And then, you know, just through seeing him, how he shaped the sound, you know, that was always great to, to have that opportunity to hear what he was doing, you know, in rehearsal on the spot. So you have like a two year session with that, which is basically a master class every single time <laughs> with these yeah. these people watching you. And and it was interesting you talked about the programming because I know like I, I have a whole set of the the U of I CDs. They're called the Beijing Years and it's just all this great right. band rep. And we think of them as, as war horses today, but in reality, Beejan was kind of hip with this programming, right? He was he was programming a lot of new pieces, commissioning pieces, and and you know at the same time, kind of respecting the the tradition of the band with some of the older pieces as well. Yeah, I I agree with that. You know, Beejan told me on many occasions. He said, "Look," he says, he says, you know, there's contemporary literature. You have to go ahead and address. And, you know, I was there my last two years before he retired. And so during that time, he was programming a lot of his favorites, you know, and, and it was great to go ahead and, you know, revisit those works. So, you know, there was that element of it. But what he said over and over again was he said, play great music. He says, don't worry about it if something was written today or last week. He said, play great music. He said, he said it's the greatest motivator for student performers. And so, you know, that's what he looked at. And he played, a, he played a lot of transcriptions. And I wish more people would play more of the transcriptions. I know that for a while, you know, in the 1960s and 70s in particular, we were trying to build a repertoire for the wind band. And, you know, most of it, we were borrowing repertoire from whether it was something like an organ repertoire or whether more, more likely the orchestra literature. So we had to do that until we could get enough music that was written originally for a band. But Beejan was playing, uh, playing those, uh, those transcriptions. The thing I've always told my students, my undergraduate students, and even graduate students, was I said, you know, when you play transcriptions, you're playing music by masters. We're never going to, in Grout, we're never going to see Percy Granger. Alfred Reed, whomever, David Maslanka. And so if, if you have an opportunity to play some really fine transcriptions of Bach or Tchaikovsky or Wagner, now you have a foundation for your students to build their musicianship from. Now you can have repertoire that the students can go ahead and look up, whether it's on YouTube or wherever. And, and so it's, it's a great way of going ahead and providing a very thorough musical education. So anyway, great music, you know, that was one of the things that, that Beejan always uh, was so fond of saying. The other thing is, you know, play marches. It's our history. And for whatever reason nowadays, you just don't hear a march anymore. And I remember many, many, many years ago, it was, it was um, before I studied with Beejan. So I want to say it was the late 70s, early 80s. In the instrumentalists, he wrote an article called, oh, let's see, it's, oh, the forgotten march. And, you know, he, basically what he did through the article was explain how he goes ahead and rehearses a march and how does he develop his, his interpretation. And it's just right there would be a master class on how to rehearse a band. And, you know, I, I have to stop first and say, and the thing that came across the strongest through, and throughout that uh, article was, he said, treat it as a great piece of music. This is great music. You have to treat it with the care that you would for any great piece of music. So, you know, hopefully we'll get back to that where, you know, the marches will come back in fashion and everyone will be playing them. So can I put you on the spot and ask you about either your favorite marches or maybe even just some recommended marches? Oh, my. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, and and I'm the worst when it comes to. So someone says, "Give me a a, a list of some some uh, pieces." 
my brain goes dead and, you know, I have to say, let me get to my list. <laughs> I think my favorite march is a Sousa march, Ferris of the Fair. It's tuneful. It's, it's uh, got a lilt to it. Uh, there's an energy to it that's just wonderful. Uh, so that's my favorite. Some other favorites. Let's see. Oh, gosh, Fillmore. There's, there's so many marches by Fillmore. But Rolling Thunder, you know, is just such a great march. What a technical challenge. You know, whether, whether it's the low brass, low reeds, you know, give that to them. And, and you know, let's see what they can do, do with that. So, uh, I mean, any, any Sousa march, Fillmore march, King marches, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Emblem of Unity by J.J. Richards, that's, that's a march that's hardly ever played. And, you know, it just, I've done that march a lot for honor bands. Kids love it. And, of course, mom and dad in the audience, they love it as well. So, you know, you just have to go ahead and make sure you're playing them well and you bring that energy that's so unique uh, you know, with a march. I mean, think about it. You could have the most intense, challenging, contemporary symphony. End your program with there. I'll end a program with Stars and Stripes. Who gets the better <laughs> applause? <laughs> well, now the prepared list. Are there any either forgotten or lesser known pieces of music that you would like to recommend to our listeners? Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I wrote down a few. Um, a great grade three literature. Let's start there because I think that's one of the more difficult grade levels to find good quality music. Is grade fantastic. Three. Colonial Collage by James Jose. Uh, that's a, a, a piece I do very often with festival bands. Kids love it, absolutely love it. And it's not only just really good music, but it's a good teaching piece as well. So that, that was the first one I thought of. Another one, and I'm sure this is something that's been forgotten, is by Bob Sheldon, and it's one of his earlier works called Southwest Saga. And you might be familiar, and a lot of band directors are, are familiar with uh, Kerno's uh, transcription of The Cowboys. I don't know if you know that one. Yeah, so this yeah. Is wonderful, wonderful uh, transcription that, uh, of John Williams' movie music. Um, and this Southwest Saga is a great three, which sounds, has that same flavor as uh, Colonel's The Cowboys. And then one of my favorites would be Jager's Third Suite. And uh, I, I think, again, that's something that's, that is forgotten about, not programmed hardly at all. Now, I have a, a certain affinity for it because uh, my first university position was at Tennessee Tech University. And Bob was the, the coordinator of composition and theory there while I was director of bands. So I had a chance to work with Bob Jager every day. And, and I just looked forward to the next day, just get a chance to sit down with Bob and talk about music, talk about the band history that he went through. It, it just really just a, an amazing time. And I was there from 1984 to 1987. And it was during a time period where Bob was just probably his most prolific time period. Turned out a lot of great music during that time. And the first piece I remember was uh, Esprit de Cord. And that was one of those things we used to, at, at Tennessee Tech, uh, usually in February, we had a very large band festival. Usually there were four honor bands and the, they, and the students would come not only from Tennessee, but from the surrounding states as well. So it was really a big festival. And Bob called me up. Uh, it was, uh, oh, I want to say somewhere around late November, early December. And he said, I want you to come up. He said, I got to play for you a recording. You're going to want to go ahead and open your program at the festival. And so walked upstairs, went to his studio, and he pu pulls in out a uh, cassette tape. And it was the United States Marine Band in a rehearsal before they premiered Esprit de Corps. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, and, and he plays it, and it's like I heard just five seconds of it, and I said, you're right. This is, Give me the parts. You know, I want to do this right away. And there's a great story behind it. Bob was very close with John Bourgeois, who was the, the conductor of the Marine Band during that time. Somewhere around 83, 84, there was a, a Beirut bombing of Marine barracks, and there was over 200 Marines killed in this bombing. And so they were going to have a ceremony for that. And Bourgeois wanted to go ahead and commission a work. And so he called up Bob and he explained what he was looking for. 
And Bob said he'd be happy to go ahead and do this. And Bob told me he just had a very, very difficult time coming up with the themes, coming up with the piece. It was just it just kind of a brain freeze when it came to this, this composition. And so he used to do um, something every week. He'd go to an afternoon movie with his daughter, Katie. And we were in Cookville, Tennessee, which is a small rural area right between Nashville and Knoxville along Interstate 40. <clears throat> small community. So he would go to movies with, with Katie, but they were always about six to nine months behind. And so uh, they were going to E.T. And so <clears throat> Bob's sitting there just enjoying the movie. And he's waiting, of course, like all musicians, we wait for the credit music because that's the best music from the movie. And he heard that. And he told me, he said, he, after hearing the credit music, he said, he got in the car and he drove, drove them back to their house. It was about a 15 minute drive. And within the 15 minutes, he had all the themes and he had the overall structure of the piece. And he wrote the piece in about three days after that. Wow. And he just had, he knew what he, he wanted to do, being inspired by the music of John Williams. So anyway, there's experiences like that working with Jager that I wanted to go ahead and just talk about that. Well, I think he's going to see an uptick in sales after that. That was a pretty good sell there. <laughs> yeah. If you get a chance, do a YouTube search for ET uh, credit music. And you have to go about 30, 40 seconds into it. You'll hear, and you're saying it's, a, it's an absolute ripoff of John <laughs> Grade four music, a piece by Jim Kernel that's unfortunately is out of print now. And it's a Lone Star Celebration. And this is another work that I do at a, with a lot of music festivals. And again, very well received by, by the kids in the band. And then a classic that for whatever reason just hardly ever gets played is, is the Persichetti Pageant. We talk about the difficulty of finding good grade four literature. Here is really one of the great pieces, whether it's grade four or, or otherwise. And then one of my favorites, which is probably a grade four and a half, is the rejoicing movement from the Lotus Sutra of, uh, suite by Alfred Reed. Yeah, yeah. It, but that's uh, just a tremendous work, something that we just don't, uh, don't play. And I think this is one thing about the band profession that we need to go ahead and think about. Uh, I think it's, it's been marvelous over the last, especially the last 20 years, the amount of great music that has been produced through commissions. But it seems like we get this piece, play it one time, and then we put it in files and never hear of it again. In fact, many, many years ago, many decades ago, Frank Battisti, I, I think uh, most people are familiar with Battisti from the New England Conservatory. He wrote an article with a really special title uh, because it kind of addresses this point. And the title of the, uh, the article was, Where Are the Second Performances? Mm. And this is something that, that we forget about, is that we have this great music and we just forget about it after the premiere. And I think what we need to do is keep going using that Bijan mantra of play great music. We need to go ahead and promote the great repertoire of the wind band by playing those classic works, the core repertoire. So whether it's something like pageant or whether it's something like a Maslanka symphony, they really have to be held on equal, uh, equal footing. And that, I guess that's an interesting gauge of, of a piece is to maybe talk to your kids afterwards and, and ask them like, Two years later, what piece do you want to play again? And, yeah, and chances, yeah. I mean, because I've I've had that where my my seniors this year, who unfortunately had their year cut short, but my my first year at, at Central, we played Carmina Barana. We did okay with it all year long. They were saying, "Can we play that at our final, you know, concert?" Oh, sure. And and I'm sure there was the sentimental part of it that that was their first piece as a freshman class, but we also played other pieces that they weren't asking for as well so you know in, interesting where where when is the second performance there i'd love to to follow up and here was here is one of the things that um i was very excited to talk to you about and it's about the research that you've done 
and I know you have a, a doctoral dissertation that uh, was was heavily awarded, and you've got some more recent research as well. One of the questions I was kind of preparing was, what are maybe some topics in music ed or teaching in general that you were thinking about either maybe doing some more study in or maybe that you think somebody else could go out and, and do some research on? Well, yeah, thanks for looking into that because so many times we, we write a paper, or give a presentation and, you know, present some ideas out there and we never get an opportunity to revisit that. So thanks for that. My research area was and is primarily historical in nature. History has been something that I've always been fascinated with. I, I was very fortunate when I was doing my doctoral work at Illinois to work with John Grayshall. And Grayshall uh, was one of the great band historians. And so I, I didn't realize there was this avenue of research that was out there. So he introduced me to that and, and encouraged me to to continue exploring that area. That's something that's been very, very special for me, and I've enjoyed the opportunity. My dissertation dealt with the development of the instrumentation of the collegiate band, and, and we, you have to be very specific when it comes to a, a doctoral dissertation. So I only looked at from 1905 to 1941. 1905 was important because of so many of the great band program started in 1905. Not sure exactly why it's 1905, but you know something like U of I band program really gets going at that time. The Purdue University program got going at that time. So you know there was that, and then 1941, obviously World War II started, and that had a definite impact on the number of musicians on any one campus. So we looked at uh, influences on the instrumentation. So there was that part of it, and, and I also had a couple of offshoot uh, publications from that, looking at the American Bandmasters Association and what they did in terms of the instrumentation. And so a lot of, there was a lot of that in which that uh, professional association did in the 1930s in terms of developing this thing called band and how they used the orchestra as a model. And, and so, you know, what they did, they looked at things that they said, okay, well, we have to have first violins. Who would, create, who would solve that part of the problem? And so, you know, we, we talk about flute section, piccolo, clarinets, you know, that type of thing, and on and on. So they had that correlation between the orchestra and the wind band. I, I had One of my favorite research projects I did was on the history of the, of the Salmer brothers and how and why they moved from New York City to Elkhart, Indiana. And that was just really fascinating. And, you know, the, I, I think the overall thing that, that really intrigued me and what, what I really have enjoyed with historical research is the challenge of finding the information, those artifacts. That's so special. So I went out to Con Selmer and talked with the people there, and I was hoping that they would have some type of archival information. And they said, you know, they kind of shook their heads and they said, you know, no one has looked at this stuff in decades. I said, well, can I go ahead and browse around? And they said, sure, go ahead. They said, good luck. I don't think we're going to find anything. Well, I started digging around, and I ran across an article that was in French. And I, and I studied French in school for three years. And so I, at the time, I could still read somewhat, you know. But I was able to read enough that I, thought, I said, this is something special. So I made a copy of it, of it took it back with me found a graduate student fluent in French, and I said, translate this for me. Well, what it was was, was one, of the, one of the Selmer brothers being interviewed, talking about the history of the Selmer company, and everything was laid out there, you know. So that was, that was just a, a blast to go ahead and work through because he found out about so many people, you know. We talk about the Bundy instrument, you know, that's part of the Selmer line, right? Okay, well, there was a guy who was president of Salmer after the Salmer brothers went into retirement, his name was Bundy. And so, you know, it's all of a sudden, you know, you have a part of the puzzle. And so, you know, you have the Bundy line of instruments. So, you know, it's kind of, you, you get clarity onto why things happened, how they happened, important and influential individuals. And so that's been always the fun part of, of historical research. And the resources are, are out there. I mean, now, because of the internet, 
things are much more readily available to you. But I used to just enjoy going into a library and and just just going through the stacks and just touching and grabbing the book, you know, thumbing through the pages. Um, there's a connection there, that, and it really gets you going. You know, you get excited about that you're holding something that's so, you know, so special for what you, you know, the project that you're doing at the time. I was going to say the last part, and it's, it's somewhat historical in nature, was I looked at compositions and composers. And uh, I, I had some great interviews from that. And, and with being from Joliet, I know you'll, you'll like this one that I interviewed Ron Nelson, who is a Joliet native, uh, played in the Joliet band. Well, I have to tell you something. With Ron told me, and this was one of the things he was most uh, proud of, is that he graduated from high school in three years. I thought it was so strange for him to think about that in terms of his career. He said, this is one of the best things I've ever done. Okay, and so that's was- that's funny because I have never been able to find any programs of his fourth year in the program. And that's okay. that clears that's- that up. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> he played he played it. string bass in the band. And Correct. I think I mentioned to you the other day, we have we have a student composition projects. So there's right. one called If I Could Say, and it's got notes on it from uh, Bruce House Connect, who was our band director there and who was a Neil Cho's composer. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was, uh, you know, that was just by, by luck that I had that opportunity to work with him. I belong to a, a, an international association of, of band historians, kind of the ultimate geek group to belong to, right? And and we meet every two years and do and people submit papers and we do presentations. So it was during a time I was trying to find a, a, a subject matter for the next conference. And I was frantically looking through things because I was ready to go out and visit my parents who uh, moved out to the Phoenix, Arizona area. And so I was looking through some, some resources I, I have, looking through internet uh, resources. And I was thinking of, of people, thinking of compositions. And what I, I love the music of Ron Nelson, always been a huge fan of his, and I always have programmed a lot of his pieces. And, you know, I, I just stopped and thought, I said, you know, I'm never seeing any type of work done on Nelson. And I said, this is so strange, you know. Uh, you know, the series Composers on, Compos- uh, on Composition. They have that series. Nelson's not not listed in there. Yeah, and when I was talking with his wife, who is his agent, I explained to her that the, the next day I was going to come out to Arizona and I could meet with him. I said, "Do you think he'd be willing to do an interview?" And she said, "Okay." She said, "Give me give me an hour." She says, "He's out of the house right now." I said, "I'll talk with him and we'll get back to you." So she called back and, and he said, "Yeah, he'll be happy to meet with you. He'll give you forty five minutes." And I said, well, where, where are we going to meet? And she says, uh, you know, this uh, uh, mall, shopping mall. She said, there's going to be a food court. He'll meet you there. I said, great. This sounds good. So, you know, I flew into Phoenix, was with my folks for a while. And the next day, I went ahead and drove out to that shopping mall to interview him. Well, make this short, after two and a half hours of talking with him, <laughs> He looked at his watch and he said, oh, my gosh. He says, my wife's been waiting for me for an hour and a half. He says, let's wrap this up. And he still gave me another 10, 15 minutes. So what a, what a fascinating person. And, you know, the thing that really uh, struck me was just how humble of a person he is and just how positive an individual he is. And, you know, it was just a, just a great, great uh, experience for me to go ahead and, and talk with him. Well, we love his music out here, of course. And, um, you know, it's interesting because some of it's hard. It's beautiful stuff. But like Rocky Point Holiday is just so, so difficult. And along with Rocky Point, you know, and he has that in the title, Rocky Point Holiday. A lot of times when you would take his family on a a summer holiday retreat, he spent time writing during that. So you're going to see, you're going to hear that, and 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 not only hear the word, but the style. The, the you know he called his holiday overtures. Now there's four of them for band. Most of them are transcribed for orchestra, and then he had a total of eight uh, holiday overtures 
uh, that he wrote for the orchestra. And, and so the band works uh, would be Rocky Point, Savannah River Holiday, Aspen Jubilee, and then Sonoran Desert Holiday. Those were the four band holiday pieces. And what it came out of, that style, is that, if I remember right, it's 1947. Uh, he's just finished his junior year, and he's graduated from Joliet. And he goes out to uh, Hollywood, where he had, I believe it's an uncle, who was a, a composer for TV series and movies. And so he spent the summer out with his uncle, uh, just, you know, meeting composers, just being, being just inundated in that, uh, that, that style of composition and just the, the media as well. And then he goes ahead and, and he went to Eastman for all of his degrees, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. Well, he was there from 47 to, I, I want to say, 56, something like that. But anyway, the important thing is he was there when Finale created the wind ensemble. Oh, wow. And okay. That, that was another of great influences for him, just to hear that band and use that as a foundation for the sound he was trying to create. So that Hollywood style, you know, you think through, you know, the last section of Rocky Point Holiday. Think what that sounds like. It's it's movie music, you know. Absolutely. And so he's got that that element to it, just because of these uh, isolated uh, incidences. So I'd love to then. We got a couple couple more things here. I know one of the things that we were um, talking about a little bit ahead of time was that you'd, you'd like to maybe address the curricular design of undergraduate conducting classes. Yeah, I, I did a uh, a research project uh, on undergraduate conducting curricula. And what I did was I, I uh, let's see, if I, this, was, this was done quite a few years ago, so I'm going to try and remember this. All the Big Ten universities that offer a degree in music, which would be all of them except for Purdue. And then there was usually a regional campus as well. So Illinois State University was part of the study. Uh, Western Michigan, if I remember right, was part of the study. Bowling Green, Ohio, universities of, of, of that style. And, and, and we just surveyed their conducting faculty on what they did. Part of it was the content of the courses. You know, part of it was the type of assessments that they did. Uh, did they use recordings? Did they use live musicians? You know, things like that, just to get, be able to describe what, what, what people were doing out there. And there are some interesting things that came about. Most of the universities uh, offered two classes, a beginning class and an advanced class. That's pretty typical. Some, like the University of Illinois, offered three semesters of, of conducting. Um, so we, we were looking at that, but the thing I noticed about in terms of the sequencing was that more times than not, two people, a, a different person taught each class, but there was never any type of correlation between what was happening in the first class to the second class. So no one sat down, or very few people sat down, I should say, and said, okay, from day one of the intro class to the last day of the advanced class, we should have a progression here in terms of what the students should be learning so that, that there's a natural sequence to go from the intro to the advanced class. So th there was that uh, that came about, you know, from, from surveying everyone. The other thing is, in terms of the content, the curricular content, it's like you, you have to ask the question, well, what is conducting? Because if you ask an undergraduate student what's conducting, the first thing that they'll, they'll talk about is baton technique. And for me, that was one of the, I don't, don't want to say least important, but not, a, not something that important. To me, score reading, in particular transpositions, I think is the most challenging thing for undergraduates. And so when I was uh, as, at Illinois State and, and I was in charge of the undergraduate degree program, you know, I, I, what I try to do is not only get transpositions and score reading within the conducting classes, but also in the method classes. 
the theory classes. I even talked to the applied faculty, and there was this one situation where I won't say which place it was and what instrument, but there was a, a, an undergrad music ed major who did not know the transposition for their own major instrument. Wow. And, you know, and, and so instead of trying to go ahead and reach and help that person in a single conducting class or two conducting classes, you know, I tried to go ahead and build this where from the day they came on campus with freshman theory, and apply instruction is to hit this idea of being able to be a, a literate musician. And, and you can go ahead and read music and whether you have to transpose something or not, you have to be able to do that. So, you know, the idea of what is a conducting class and so score reading, score analysis, and then you get into something like baton technique. And then the last thing, which is the most important, but which I, I really feel from the, 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 type of research projects I've done, you can kind of prepare the student for this, for their, for their student teaching, but it takes years of, within the profession before they develop their oral skills. And, you know, let's face it, it comes down to the most important thing are our ears. You know, we have to be able to hear. You have to be able to hear the correct note, the correct rhythm, correct intonation, correct balance. That's the hardest thing. So my, my philosophy of getting around that was build the skills, the, the baton technique, the score reading, so they don't have to think so much about what they're doing, and they can pay attention to what their students are doing. And, and so that's, to me, that's what was behind my curricular design for, for undergraduate conducting, is make it so that they have all the skills necessary, all the competencies, and the competencies would be something like Formata treatments. Can, do they know how to do a formata treatment? If it's, if it's an asymmetrical meter, do they understand how to make that conducting gesture? If there's a crescendo, do they know how to go ahead and do that gesture? And just work on that so that it's almost second nature, so that they can then do what they really need to do, where the real teaching comes in, and that is they can listen to their students, they can watch their students play, and, you know, they put their focus as teachers onto their students rather than what they're doing. How many times do you see a conductor and they've got their head buried, right? And so, you know, we always talk about, you know, keep the head out of the score, have the score in your head. And so that's to me was just some of the highlights for the, the undergraduate conducting curriculum. And that's interesting because I think about at least myself, and I'm by no means a world's greatest conductor at all, but I'm, I think I'm 13 or 14 years in, and this is the first year I realized that I was actually looking at the score as a whole and not just reading my main instrument part. I think a quick win in conducting is getting the beat pattern down, and then, you know, you're a conductor, yay, but that's not <laughs> the reality of, of what you're saying there. Right. So, and then coming back full circle, you know, you were talking about your internship from, uh, I think, 1982 to 1984 with, you know, or over at Illinois. And, and it sounds like that, you know, was was here's a sequence, here's a scope, whether they meant it to be that way or not. But also, uh, I'm assuming based on what you said, that you had the majority of those people for two years, or you at least had one main person with, with Dr. Beach, and that was kind of pushing you through that program so we had a consistency and we, we had a, a cohesive program going on yeah yeah absolutely so but you know it's one of those things where you know just in general the undergraduate studies you know when you think of the number of the small number of classes you have that deal with the the actual teaching of band or music in general if you wanted to go ahead it's very 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 sparse number you know, you think about it, a third of the third of the undergraduate degree program is general studies. You know, your math, your English, your sciences. A third of it is music focus, which is going to be your theory, your history. You could say applied studies, you know, that type of thing. So then you have only about a third and, and uh, dealing with education and it's split between the College of Education, you know, the professional ed classes, whether it's ed psych or, or ed history. And then you have this very, very little, you know, two classes in, in uh, conducting, two classes probably in, in methodology. 
I'm surprised we can turn out any competent teachers. You know, there's just not not the substantive type program. And, you know, the most important experience is the student teaching uh, internship. That's the most important thing. And so, you know, I've always have said I don't prepare my students for their first year of teaching. I prepare them to go ahead and have a successful student teaching experience. So knowing what the, that foundation should be, you know, and then they can go out and hopefully they've got a really good co-op, a really good supervisor that can support them through this transition into the profession. And, you know, um, uh, it would be great if they could extend the internship period and not just a, a, a 16 weeks of student teaching. It would be great if, if they could have a full year. I think that, that first year would be th that much more successful. A lot of your students hold you in very high regard. And when you think of these students, what do you hope has been your biggest impact on them? Well, that's, that's really kind of you to go ahead and mention this because it's, it's something that, you know, when I first started out <clears throat> in higher education, I, I was really focused on having a career as a conductor. But at the same time, the back of my, my mind was that I wanted to go ahead and as best I could influence the next generation of teachers. Because as I was going through my undergraduate degree program, you know, I saw some of my friends be successful, other, others were not as successful, and it's like we're going through the same experience. Why is that? You know, why, why, what can we do to go ahead and, and build better teachers? I guess that's what it came down to. And I always thought, I said, you know, I, I think at some point in my career I want to transition into that, where it's full-time dealing with conducting, especially methods classes, that type of thing, and nurturing and mentoring student teachers. And so the thing I, that I, I think in reflecting back now, because I, I ended up teaching, I think it was 41 years. Uh, eight, eight of the years were in uh, public schools, primarily at the high school level, but I did teach five through 12. And, I th and in some ways, I think that's the best experience a, a young teacher can have, is teaching beginners at the elementary level, middle school, and high school. And the reason I always said that was as a high school director, when I was thinking about what do I want my students to experience as high school students and say, you know, okay, a ninth grader. Well, the only way I can go ahead and build that sense of curriculum there is knowing what eighth graders can do. And you can keep building off that, you know, vertical, vertically, downward, upward, you know, by, by thinking about that natural sequence from fifth grade all the way through their senior year. But the thing I, I really what it comes down for me is is when in terms of mentoring, I, I think of my experience with Bijan where with his his conducting internship program, he was my main mentor. And the thing that where Bijan I thought was very successful was that he gave you the opportunity. Now a lot of times he gave you enough leeway where you would fail. And you know, he's not gonna leave you without a safety net. There'd be a safety net. But you got to go ahead and let the person go ahead and experience it and just guide them. Don't don't tell them, but guide them. I think that's the most important thing. So, you know, I, I think back to my students who have been successful. It, it, it's it's just giving them some direction, but but never just saying, here's the way of doing it. And I think that's kind of um, I don't want to say contradictory, but it, inherent to the profession, I think in order to be a very successful uh, band director, orchestra conductor, choir conductor, whatever, is that you've got to be passionate about what you're doing. And then as well, you have to have conviction in what you're doing. You believe what you're doing is best for your students. So now if you go ahead and mentor a student teacher, I don't believe that that you know, with my graduate assistants, for example, another form of student teaching, it wasn't I was going to go ahead and, and explain to them how to be how to be a Joe Manfredo band, but it was here's here's some foundational principles that you can rely on to be a, a, an effective teacher of band, of choir, of orchestra, whatever. So it's about just you know I think true nurturing, true mentoring is about guiding and not telling. And so hopefully, I, I, I hope my students think that, you know. Uh, 
my, my from my perspective, that's what I tried, you know, sure. and hopefully it came out okay. Well, Dr. Manfredo, thank you so much again for for sitting down and, and speaking with me today. And uh, you gave me a a lot to think about and a lot to research and and a lot of good music to uh, research as well and and listen to. So I appreciate your time. Well, John, thanks for the opportunity to go ahead and meet with you and talk. I, I really enjoyed just a great conversation. You're doing a great job, not only with this, but with what you're doing with your Joliet band. So continued success. I, I, I know you, your students will really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much.